So, if we haven't met, my name is Sam, and I just told you a whole bunch of stuff about what you're supposed to do in November, and you said, why is this guy telling me all that stuff? We are starting a new sermon series. It's four weeks, and uh, it's a little bit different than, uh, than, than, than things that we've done before. Honestly, it's a little bit different than, um, than, than preaching that I've done before, and um, and so Pastor Charlie and I have been, have been working on this. And part of the reason that we've been working on this is because we've realized that there, there needs to be some space to talk about some of the, the parts of Christianity that aren't always central. They're not always the most important thing. They're not the things that get the most attention. But maybe if you're reading through your Bible, you get this like weird passage and you say, that's really odd. I don't know what to do with that. That's one of those ones. And you say, I don't know. And you just move on because you feel funny about it. Or, or you're reading through and you hit a weird passage and then another weird passage and another weird passage. And you say, I'm not, what do, what do I do with it? Like maybe this morning you noticed like rulers and thrones and dominions, things in earth and things in heaven. And you say that, what is he actually, you, like maybe you just run past it and you say, I'm sure somebody knows what it means, but I don't know what it means, so that's no big deal. Or what if we actually slow down and said, what do these things mean for all of us? And so we're, we're looking at this, uh, we're taking four weeks to look at some of these important things that help us understand, maybe in a, in a broader way and a deeper way, the world that God has made. So Paul in Romans 12 says this, he says, do not let your mind be conformed to this present age, but he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's really what I'm hoping that we're going to do today. We're going to be specifically looking at Acts chapter 17, Acts 17, 16 through 32. This is a a fairly uh, well-known story if you've been around the church, but maybe it's it's one that, that has more help for us today than we might realize. If you want to grab a Bible underneath your seat, it's going to be on page 926, roughly. Uh, Most ESV Bibles kind of all line up like that, fortunately. This is 1716. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city that was full of of idols. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be preaching, to be a preacher of, of a foreign divinities because he was preaching of Jesus in the resurrection. And they took hold of him and they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. And we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he has made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way towards him and find him. Yet 
He is actually not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and imagination of man. The time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear you again about this. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for this time in your holy word. Would you help us and guide us? Would you let us walk through this and understand you and not just hear of this story a long time ago, but also recognize that that there is something for us in this. Help us to open our eyes. Help us to see how our minds might be renewed. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you a question. How important are stories? like kind of important, you know, for kids, they're great. But then you grow up and you grow up past stories. I don't know, how important are stories to each and every one of us? I would actually say very, very important. And, and I wouldn't be alone. In fact, the, the American Psychological Association has, has a whole side of their work that is called behavioral cognitive therapy, or I'm sorry, cognitive behavioral therapy. And two of the founding principles of cognitive behavioral therapy are this. The first is that psychological problems are based in part on faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking And the second is this, that psychological problems are based in part, they're always, you know, kind of being careful here, they're based in part on learned patterns of unhealthy behavior. That people tell themselves stories and that they live those stories out and that that actually affects someone. So for instance, if you take a child when they're in first grade and you tell them they're stupid, you tell them they cannot learn, that they cannot understand, that they'll never get it right when they're in fifth grade, when they're in seventh grade, when they're in eighth grade, we know the outcome, don't we? We know that if someone is told the wrong story over and over and over again long enough, that it changes how they see themselves. It changes how they see their world. It changes even how they live and how they act. Even if they have in them the ability to do the math problem, they will say, I'm stupid. I don't know how to do these things. I can't possibly do them. Stories matter a lot. In fact, a lot more than we would even recognize. And so, Paul, he, he actually says the same thing. He, he, he warns us of this. Now, this passage is often used in a different way, but he says this. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And he says, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, often that statement is said out kind of in this, in this very theological And there's probably a few of you in the room that are salivating, excited, and there's several of you saying, oh my gosh, what's he going to do next? This thing called apologetics. And often this apologetics thing is used to debate and argue with people who are not Christians. And people take this verse and say, that's really all that this verse is about. But what's also being said here is that in our own minds, in our own thoughts, 
we have to take every thought captive. We have to ask ourselves, what are the stories about our world that we believe, that we tell ourselves? What are the things that we assume about the way that the world works? And that's really what I want to talk to you guys about today. That there are, in fact, stories of the world and what you should expect and what you should believe and why it is the way that it is that go deep to the roots of how you interact on a daily basis and often we don't even recognize them. And so what I, I want to do is I want to give you three statements. Like I said, this is not the kind of sermons I normally give, but I realized this is, this is my attempt to, to pretend to be an adjunct philosophy professor at a small, struggling Christian college that might or might not have enough students next year to keep its doors open, if you understand the kind of joke that I'm saying there. Ready? But here are these three rules that we need to understand for this morning. Every culture tells a story. Conflicting stories can't be held together. And we have to examine the story we are living out. Every culture tells a story. Conflicting stories can't be held together. And we have to examine the story that we are actually living out. Now, let's go back to that story in Athens with Paul. Paul, it says in in Acts 17, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him for he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, here, here's the way that, that the, the Roman and, and Athens, especially in the Roman Empire, worked. Maybe when you were in school, you heard this phrase, the Greco-Roman world. Because the Roman world conquered and they ruled and they managed the world, but it was actually Greek thought and Greek philosophy that still kind of ruled and was still the most important. And so Paul was now in Greece. He wasn't in Rome. And yet, in some ways, he was in the, Athens was the center of ideas. The same way that for a very long time, if you wanted to make a movie, right, that would create an idea, uh, that get out into the culture, you go to Hollywood. Or if, if you wanted to become, if you wanted to become a musician, you, you might go to, well, at one point, you go to Seattle, or you go to New York, or you go to Nashville. Now it's basically, you just go to Nashville. If you wanted to become a writer, you would go to certain cities. If you wanted to be on Broadway, you wouldn't move to Cincinnati, would you? In the same way, if you wanted to be at the center of the ancient world when it came to ideas and thinking, you went to Athens. That's why Luke tells us, the author of the book of Acts, The people in Athens, even the the folks that lived there and were from there, or the folks that just moved there, they were obsessed with new ideas. That's what they did. That was the thing all the time. New ideas, fresh ideas, more to devour, more to consider. They were obsessed. And what had happened in part was that there were all these ideas and all these ways of looking at the world, but in the the in the Roman Empire, what had happened was that as the Roman Empire expanded, these philosophies and these religious views had expanded and caught up and captured all these other different ways of looking at the world. So that by the time that you got to Paul being in Athens, the Roman world had collected these different idols, these different ways of of looking at gods, and they were the god of a certain region, or the God of a certain vocation, the God of good harvests, the God of new moons, the God of fertility, the God of warfare, the God of peace. They were all these different kind of tribal and segmented small gods. In fact, what happened was sometimes they would say, well, this God seems similar to this one, and they would, they would merge them. But at other times, they would just kind of add more and more and more and more. We're in reality, there was probably what you might call deity fatigue. That there were so many gods that they had to worship, that they had to consider and think about and know about and respond to depending on what you were doing, that they actually were nervous. And they said, but what 
if we're missing one. Because the gods of the ancient world, they were petty. They, they, were, they were cruel. They would get angry. They would hold grudges. And you did not want to tick them off. And so they said, you know what? We don't know, but we think we might be missing one of them. So what we need to do is we need to just kind of make a, a, a catch-all, a backup. We need to just say, look, whoever you are, wherever you are out there, we realize you're probably angry at us. We realize that we don't know your name, but you probably have demands and expectations, and we're really sorry about this, so we're just going to make an extra portion over here for you just in case you ever show up. We want you to know we didn't mean to do it. And that was the ancient world. That was the way that people understood. That was the story that they told themselves, that they lived in a world where you might bump into a God who you didn't say thank you to enough, and he might take it out on you. And they lived with that concern. And Paul, seeing this, he offers a different story. He offers the Christian story. He says, God is, is not just over one nation. He says, the, the, the true God is not over just, just one location or one job, one position, one part of society. He said, there is a God over everything who has made everything it's not that, that there is an Indian god and there's a Greek god and there are, there are Roman gods and there are, there are Gaelic gods. No, 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 no. There is one god over everything. Now, this wasn't totally unheard of in the ancient Roman world. But what they thought of is they thought, okay, yes, technically maybe there's Zeus or there's Saturn. And then back there behind them all is this kind of bigger, unnamed kind of first mover, this kind of big, you know, this kind of the, the guy at the top of the org chart. But what they thought was that there was this kind of cosmic bureaucracy that if there was a God above those gods that you named and you knew and you watched out for and you were worried about, he was just like them, he was just farther away, and he would never interact with people like us. And Paul says, no. No, in, in fact, the God who made everything, he, he gives you gifts. He's not a jerk. He's not mad. He's not trying to demand things from you. He wants to offer you something. It's not that he takes, he wants to give. And it's not that he sends a bureaucrat to give you a message. No, no, no. What, what Paul says is he says that he is a father. And the father sends his son. And that the son is not separate, but the son is the image of that invisible God that is above all. And that the way that we see and experience the love of God is through the Son. And that all things are found in this Son. That passage that Rich read is, is maybe one of the richest in all the Bible. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, this was an incredibly different story than the story that ancient people would have told themselves. Incredibly different. And what happens, though, is that it... Some people freak out. Like, some people say, that's ridiculous. Resurrection, like a God that would, would lay down his life, that doesn't make any... No, 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 no. But some people said, wait a second. There is something here. There is something that makes sense here. There is something wonderful here. And Christianity and the explanation that Christianity offered of the world became more and more popular. Became more and more accepted. Until one day brutality wasn't accepted anymore. 
even though in the ancient Roman world it was celebrated. One day, all of a sudden, a slave and a king were assumed to live under the same laws, even though most ancient people would have said that's ridiculous. The higher up you are, the more you control the rules and you control the laws. The idea that the king is under the same law as a slave? No, 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 no. And yet, sure enough, in Christianity, that became true. The idea that it was a good thing to protect the weak, that was not a default in the ancient Roman world. In fact, that was a joke. Why would you protect the weak? If you were strong enough to do what you wanted to do, then do it. That's the purpose of strength. And all of a sudden, the Christian story and the Christian explanation moved forward. And even this idea that the world was moving forward, that God was progressing and that he was fixing and that things could get better from year to year, from generation to generation. There could even be this idea of progress. See, in the ancient world, they all were obsessed with the people that came before them. There was the golden age that existed before them. There was the myth and the heroes of old. It was the new, the, what was in front of them was never better than what had been behind them. And all of a sudden now, there's this Christian story that says that God is bringing people into a better future. And the world began to change. And the way that people understood their place in the world began to change. And, and why they existed began to change. And how they got there began to change. And where they were going began to change. For the better, I would argue. There's a, there's a book. I, this, it's, like, it's been like uh, Pastor Sam's book club the last couple of weeks, I, I recognize. Um, and, I, and I don't have the book because I listened to it on Audible, but Pastor Charlie has it, but he, Anna's reading it, so I'm kind of upset because I wanted to show you all the book and the cover of the book. But there's a book called, it, it's not Anna's fault for reading her husband's book. I just want to make sure that's clear, everybody. There's a book called The Air We Breathe by a guy named Glenn Shrivener. He's an, he's an, he's an Anglican uh, in England, and, and he runs through kind of all these different things that we take for granted, but that have deeply Christian roots because the world that that we have been coming from that existed for for 2,000 years really did it it, it was built on the foundation of the teaching of Jesus Christ now here's the thing did everybody actually live that out no did everybody actually believe that no Did people manipulate the Christian story and exploit the Christian story for the sake of getting what they want even when they didn't believe it themselves? Absolutely, tragically they did. But underneath, there were certain things about justice and mercy and right and wrong and defending the weak and not taking more than you should Rules that, that we think are just normal and, and, and just make decent society that were not assumed in the ancient world, but were actually given by the Christian story. But, of course, because not everybody believed it and not everybody lived it out, that Christian story began to be criticized. It began to be undermined. It began to be attacked. It, it came to the point where where, where for, a, 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 you know, slowly and then rapidly there was an attempt made to tell a different story. And, and in that different story, the reason that we exist was because we are self-aware. That the reason that you matter is because you can think rationally. Maybe the the one piece of Latin you remember from school is cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Now that sounds normal and acceptable, but let me ask you a question. My son Sylvan, if he cannot distinguish and declare his self-existence, does that mean that he does not exist? 
Does that mean that he is not a human being? If the rule, the rationality wins, cogito ergo sum, is the rule and the law, then maybe. And if we're starting with humans as the center of why things find their meaning and their purpose, well, then we don't need God anymore, do we? No. And in fact, within a generation or so, you know, there, there was another philosopher that came along, a man named Friedrich Nietzsche. And do you know what Nietzsche said? Nietzsche said, God is dead. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. And he bragged about it. And what that means is that there is no longer any source for absolute right and wrong. There is no more morality given from above. There is only the morality that you take for yourself. He said the power to will, that if you are stronger than somebody else, then might makes right. And he owned and you could dominate and you can control, then it was yours to take. And you know what? Very honestly, if you can get away with it, and you don't, then there's something wrong with you. That's the alternate story that began to be told. Now, of course, this different story also needed a different beginning. And the beginning came from folks like Charles Darwin, and Charles Darwin said that the world was not designed, not by a maker, not by a creator, but that the world was simply a series of almost endless dice rolls. That there was no designer but simply dice over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that with a long enough period of time, even though most of those dice rolls and those mutations were not beneficial, every once in a while there would be a positive beneficial mutation. And that is the world that we live in that is reduced, that is focused on the world that we can grab and take, a material world, a reduced, rationalistic, random, chaotic world where might makes right. And that's the world that we live in. Because even if I said Charles Darwin, I I know that some of you felt this little tinge of embarrassment. And he said, oh my goodness, I I hope that my non-Christian friends don't hear my pastor talking from the pulpit about the danger of Friedrich Nietzsche or Charles Darwin. Because there is this idea that that there is the right thing and the true thing and they have won and it is bigger and, and has been proved true. And that's the world that we live in. Now here's what happened though. Christianity didn't just get destroyed and obliterated. It just got chunked up. There were bits and pieces that were usable and and beneficial. Things like justice. Where do you get justice from cogito ergo sum? Where do you get morality? Where do you get right and wrong from Nietzsche's will to power? Where do you get the protection of the weak from an evolutionary process that says that everything should be getting better and that the weak should be eliminated from the gene pool. You don't. You don't. But we didn't didn't want to go that far, that fast. And so we kept some Christian stuff around. But it leaves the world greatly reduced. And I bet that many of us in our daily life We live out of that dice world rather than that designer world. We live out of a series of random things. We live out of the assumptions of that new world. And we keep things like mercy. We keep things like justice. But here's the challenge, right? Conflicting stories can't be held together. They can't. The same way that you can't tell a kid, you're the smartest one in your class, you can do anything that you want, and you are the dumbest kid in the class, and you will never get ahead. Conflicting stories can't be held together. And so what happens is that people who want to keep their Christianity feel that they need to reduce it 
and trim it down and trim it down and trim it down so that it is, it's a private thing, it's a polite thing, it's a part of life, but it is not the whole of life. It's something that should be kept to yourself. And that's the Christianity that many of us carry around and live out. That's the Christianity that maybe some of us have rejected. Or that's the Christianity that many of, some of us struggle to say, is, is this all that there is? Is this what I should believe? But now here's the problem. We, we find ourselves, we're, we, we want to keep a, a hope for heaven, but then in the rest of life, we feel as if we have to live like animals. That if it's dog eat dog, if it's the survival of the fittest, if, if that's true most of the time, if that's, do, do you, when you go to work, do you live out of a dog eat dog mentality? When you're driving in traffic, are you a Darwinian? Or do you believe that God made every single person in every single car as good and in need of his grace? Probably, you think, look at these stupid animals. And when you do that, you're telling yourself a certain story about the world. Now, what's happened, though, is we're a couple of generations removed from all of that. And we have to decide, do we finally get rid of those, those Christian ideas? But here's, here's the problem, though. The, this, this materialistic, relativistic, individualistic world, it, it isn't working for us. Not for all of us, anyway. And we, we feel this. We know this. We, we, we don't know what to do. It, it leads us to a place where there's no way to decide what's a good rule, what's a good law, and what's a bad law. If it's, if it's just up to me, or it's just up to you, if, if it's not that there is truth, but it's my truth and your truth, well, then whose truth wins out? The, the 51% majority, that wins out? And that decides truth? Oh, and then we got to jam the ballot boxes because if we can get to 51%, then we can decide truth. That's a certain story we're telling ourselves. What makes a person a person? What makes a life valuable? In this materialistic view, right, the only things that matter are things that can be measured. Things that can be monetized. Things that can be managed. What do you do with an adult with Alzheimer's? What do you do with a child with Down syndrome? These are not hypotheticals. These are things that are happening in our world today. And so what story are you going to tell? What story are you going to believe? See, and then what happens, though, and listen, none of this is meant to poke fun of somebody else not sitting in this room. All of this is meant to say that these ideas are coming into our head and our thinking and that we have to challenge them and that we have to question them. But what can end up happening is that we can see the end and the frailty of a world that says that it's, it's random, that it's just matter, that there's nothing beyond matter. And we can say, well, what about love? What about the soul? And we say, I don't know. I don't know. And we can, but we never want to go back to God. So we go to other things. And there are other stories that are just thrown out. If you traced out how many stories today are being told, just kind of in popular culture, where the center of the story is the idea of a multiverse. Meaning that somewhere in the universe, something is happening because we cannot get to an evolutionary process with simply one universe 
But if we had an infinite number of universes, we could get to it. If we said everywhere there is something random happening, then of course, if everything is infinitely randomly happening, we will get to truth. We will get to the truth that we want. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting story. There's no scientific backing for it. There's no proof. There's no even way to prove it. But that's the only way we can talk about randomness if, if we need that big of a number. Or some people look at the universe and they say, look, I admit the universe is, seems to be really well-ordered. It looks like maybe there is a design. And then you know what happens? Is that people talk about things like the simulation hypothesis. Literally saying, no, no, see, what it is is that we are all living right now in some big version of the matrix. And there are, there are tenured professors at Ivy League schools that have asked about the origins of the universe. They will say, I don't know, maybe that one. Maybe we are living in a simulation. Maybe there is some big cosmic entity up there who's designed everything, who's working all things out, but it's a computer. It has nothing to do with the Christian God. That's a story that's being told. And we just have to understand that. There's a professor, maybe some of you have heard of him. I, I hadn't heard of him until recently. He's, he's a professor at NYU. He is a proud atheist. He's, his man is, is named Thomas Nagel, but he, he says this when he's talking about this, the kind of unsatisfactory nature uh, uh, of the, the world that he inhabits with other atheists. He says this. He says, I don't want there to be a God. I don't want a universe to be like that. And then he says this, but my, my guess is that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition and that it is responsible for more of the scientism and reductionism of our times. And one of the tendencies it supports is the ludicrous overuse of evolutionary biology to explain everything about life. Whoa. He doesn't want to believe in God. But even he would say, the explanations that we have for the universe of dice doesn't really hold up. There's a problem. We're missing something. But what if we discover what, what Paul tried to get the people uh, of Athens to see? That the Christian story is actually not like other stories in the best ways possible. And that God is not far from us, but that he actually wants to care for you. That we would say that we have an understanding of the world that is intentional and not accidental. That it's not just that everything is random. It's not just that it's, it's, it's one big guess. That you are not simply a, a result of the die being cast over and over and over and over and over again. And that, that there really is nothing better about you being alive than about sludge in a swamp not being. But that you were designed and you were made and you were loved. And the hurt and the pain, all of those things that you experience are real and seen and known by God. The Christian story says that it is meant to be a communal life rather than an individual. It's not just that I think, therefore I am, but that we are loved and therefore we exist together as a people. That's the Christian story. So that we can care for people when they forget their own name so that we can care for people when they never even have the ability to take their first steps. Because the value of a person 
is not something that they have to make for themselves, but it's something given to them by their designer. Expansive rather than reductionistic. And this is part of why we're doing this whole series Be, because we, we I, I worry, maybe I, I won't speak for Pastor Charlie, but I worry that we have reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced the Christian story to something polite and small and something on the margins of our life that will not get us in trouble at work, that we're not really embarrassed about um, if we have to talk about it, when we have to talk about it technically. And I tell you what, I, I, don't even, I didn't even realize how much this happens, but I, I got this free hat in the mail. I, 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 uh, I, subscri- I bought this guy's book early, and it was like, the book was on sale if you bought it early, and you got a free hat if you bought, if you bought the book early, right? And so I got this hat, and the hat said, build the kingdom on it. And so it's like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm 41. Like, you're not supposed to wear Christian things. That's lame. That's not cool. Like, you're not supposed to represent the fact or tell people that you have a Christian faith. Like, you're not supposed to wear cross jewelry. You're not, like, those things for, for my generational moment, those were terrible and embarrassing, and all Christian culture is lame. And, but I, I started wearing this hat, even though Gabe told me I had to wear the hat a specific way and I couldn't wear it down or I, had to, I couldn't keep the brim flat. He said, absolutely not, unacceptable. But I wore this hat. So I, I, I wore this hat like an uh, appropriate 40-year-old dad hat. And, I, and we, went, we went to Longwood Garden yesterday and all of a sudden I, I noticed people noticing me and I realized, oh, they're, they're, they're looking at this hat. I'm a pastor And there was a part of me that wanted to take it off because I was embarrassed that people would find out that I was a Christian. It it just sits with us. It's a story that we tell that there should be something wrong. And maybe it's because we've met Christians who are total jerks. Maybe it's because when we were younger Christians, we were total jerks. But there is a better story that God wants to tell. And if he tells it through people like Paul, who was a terrible person, if you know Paul's story, you know that he was a brutal, cruel, evil man until God grabbed him and changed him and said, I'm going to send you out to tell of my love, to tell of my grace. And that's a different story. My, uh, um, my dad and I were talking. He, he's, he's visiting. And, and um, when, when I was little, my my grandmother still had the same house that, that she raised my dad in, and they had this little front room that was basically like a TV nook. I mean, the room was super tiny, and when, when I was a kid, it had one of those giant console TVs, you know, the big ones with the knobs. Now, my dad said that he's pretty sure that that wasn't the original color TV that my grandmother had gotten, that she had upgraded along the way, but that it sat basically in the same spot that the original color TV had had. And that, at some point in, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s, when, uh, when color TV became a thing, that it was the first color TV on the block. And that everybody crammed into that little room, not just the family, but the neighbors, crammed into that front TV room to see TV in color. My grandmother, I remember her telling me, she remembers when the Wizard of Oz came on TV for the first time. And that Dorothy steps out the door into color. And there was just this vivid, more alive world. God wants you to experience a more vivid story. He's not far from us. He is here to offer you that vivid and better story. One where there is a place for dignity and there's a place for justice, a place for mercy, a place for the pursuit of truth, a place for things getting better and people struggling that extends beyond the human experience but never reduces us to unimportant. God invites us into that better story where we see him as a creator and reconciler of all things. And so listen, every culture tells a story. 
conflicting stories cannot be held together. What is the story that you are living out? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this holy word. We pray that you would give us your grace. We, um, we ask you to give us clarity and thoughtfulness as we think about these things. God, if, if I've come over the top and been unkind or unfair or, 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 um, or, or um, if I've strawmanned anything, Lord, forgive me. Help us, God, to be people of truth, but Lord, it, it, it seems abundantly clear that too many of us try to hold together two conflicting stories and one story is winning out. Help us to see that. Help us to understand that. Help us in the next few weeks, Lord, to, to, to hear and understand and know this bigger, more vivid story of the world that you have created, that you are sustaining, that you are redeeming through your precious son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and respond to God in song.